Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we engage learners who lack confidence and motivation? And I'm in conversation with Rachel Thin. Hello, my name is Rachel Thin. I am currently, I um, work in a special provision for SEMH needs and uh, I'm outreach teacher so my role is to go into mainstream schools and support staff when children are presenting with different SEMH needs, um, so-called challenging behaviour, distressed behaviour, things like that. So I go into schools and and try and support staff to um, help these children to to cope and to thrive in their in their schools. Um, I've taught for um, taught in mainstream for about eighteen years, and then I moved to specialist setting, and then I've been doing outreach for six years. And I'm sorry. No, no, go. <laughs> currently um, writing a book called Behaviour Barriers and Beyond, and um, yeah, that that's kind of me in a nutshell. I'm also mum to two lovely girls. So you are um, working on the topic that everybody needs to hear about right now. So thank you so much for uh, coming along and and, and talking today for for the podcast. And I hope there'll be some uh, practical ideas we can share and also some perceptions we can challenge. I think that there's a a bit of that to be done. So Mm -hmm. our our episode question, our kind of jumping off point, if you like, is how can we engage learners who lack confidence and motivation? So do you want to maybe just speak to that for for a little bit and, and get us going and then we'll see where this takes us? I think the first thing to do is kind of be curious and to wonder why they're lacking motivation and confidence. Um, And I think the the main way to do that is through adult child relationship and to form those relationships. I think that's that's the biggest resource in schools and it's what sometimes kind of gets missed in the day-to-day running of everything. So I think, yeah, why, why are they, not motivated why are they finding things difficult and and the more we can find out about what's actually challenging them the better so is it are they lacking a skill are they lacking some understanding is there something else going on at home um there's so many reasons aren't there but it's it's that why and once we know why then we can obviously put in steps to to support them and to help motivate them more but um yeah, I think that was what struck me when you asked the question originally is like, why, why are they lacking motivation? Um, and then once we know why, then obviously we can talk about kind of steps for each. For each. So we're almost <laughs> jumping in at one point. We're trying to ta- tackle the, the behaviour that we're seeing, whereas actually we should be working out what's the cause for the behaviour in the first place. Yeah, the, the behaviour is communicating something, isn't it? Is it communicating distress is it communicating anxiety are, are they lacking a skill do they need a bit more help do they need a task broken down um that that i think and then once you know why then obviously the steps can be put in to help and is it it might be scaffolding the task chunking it down um you know giving them little little steps to help if it's anxiety putting in those little steps to get them there easing those anxieties um things like that. So how do we find out why we're seeing this behaviour? What, what are the mechanisms that you use for working out the answers to that question? I'm in quite a lucky position, I guess, when I go into schools, because I can just observe that one child and I can focus on that one people, um, which in a class of 30, you don't always have the luxury of doing, but um, that I can often pick up on, um, you know, are they looking around the room? Are they, look, are they seeking help? Are they distracted about something environmental going on? Is it something sensory? Um, so I think if you if you have that luxury, observing the child and, and talking to the child, talking to them, once you've got that relationship as the teacher or an adult in school, you know, well, I wonder what that I wonder what that was like for you. I wonder why you found that so difficult. And just just being curious about what is going on for the child and and then um, then to help. So then if they need help with the task, we can break it down into chunks. We can we can put those supports in, we can give them the, the knowledge and the visual supports that they need. Um, if it's something else going on, we can give them the outlet to express their feelings and to talk. And it's all those um, 
like I wonder, as, as Louise Bomber would, you know, would say, well, those I wonder scripts and wondering about the child and being tentatively curious about what's going on for them. And do you find that children are quite happy to engage with you on these kinds of questions when you ask them? You know, if you do become curious and you begin to wonder why these things are happening and why you're seeing the behaviour that you're seeing, are they up for chatting about that or can this be difficult? In my role, I tend to work with the staff and give them the skills because I obviously have got no relationship with the child and I think the relationship is so, so important. So... I would talk to the staff and give them the tools to do that rather than me doing it. Because I think me going in and yeah, like you say, why would they talk to some stranger coming into school? So yeah, I would I would give the, the staff those tools to have those conversations and then they can take it on longer term rather than me kind of dipping in and dipping out again. So yeah, that's my role to give the staff the tools to then carry that on. So who is the best person to be having these conversations with the child? Is it the, the teacher or a support member of staff? Do parents and carers get involved? Like who, who has these conversations and, and, and gets curious and helps to find the why? I think anyone who's got a really good relationship with the child, really. Ideally, um, someone in school, yeah, support staff, the teacher, if they've got time. Um, it, it's so, so important. And I say if they've got time, they need everyone needs to make time to build relationships don't they? and be curious about the child's needs and I think that's that's the foundation that we can then build on for the learning um so yeah any anyone who can build a, a relationship with a child but mainly that kind of small team of key adults within the school would be ideal and talk to me about some of the themes that you see so it seems like understanding why we're seeing the behaviour is really important. And you've mentioned a couple of times uh, things around uh, skills or, or confidence or anxiety that might underpin um, why we're seeing what we're seeing. Are those the things that you're most commonly seeing? And, and, and what should we be maybe looking out for? Because I think it's important that we learn to ask the question, but having some idea of what might be the you know the motivations and the drivers here is, is presumably quite helpful for those adults. Um. I think it, it in for, for children I support or for staff I support it's it's those big behaviors that it's coming out as generally so the so-called challenging behavior which I would like to reframe as distressed behavior or overwhelmed behavior or dysregulated behavior just something a bit more positive than challenging um but I yeah for what for, for when, by the time I get involved it, it's generally coming out in those those big behaviours where things are being thrown, which are the pupil is leaving the room, um, the inappropriate behaviours that we see in school and more and more, um, that's that's by the time I get there. But I, I think we need to get in earlier, don't we? And and give those um, the teachers those skills to 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 manage those behaviours a bit earlier and to know that the behaviour is communicating something and to find out what that is. So there's a couple of things there. So one I think is around, um, yeah, really unpicking, yeah, that that idea around challenging behaviour and what the issues are with that term and why we need to look at reframing it. And then that question of, of behaviour as communication. So maybe if we start with um, with the idea of challenging behaviour, and that's a commonly used term um, and one that I, I'm i picking up on the subtle cues that you maybe don't really like it. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I think it... it if we change the way we view the behaviour and see it as communication, see it as communicating distress, um, it's more easy to be compassionate. It's easier to to kind of have that empathy that we need when when helping the children and supporting them and putting measures in. To, to I think if you've got the relationship and you've got that empathy, then the behaviour automatically improves. So, uh, yeah, I think renaming and reframing how we talk about it. Is, a, is kind of a step in the right direction in being more positive in how we support, maybe. Yeah, so you think that we should be um, talking about seeing uh, dis distress rather than challenging behaviour, is that right? Or are there other terms that you find helpful? Um, distress, sometimes it's overwhelm, sensory overwhelm, um, some form of emotional dysregulation, uh, I would say. 
and is a compassionate and kind of kind and caring response. I, I completely hear what you're saying, that if we see this behaviour as a child who is distressed or overwhelmed, that perhaps it's it's more obvious to us how we should um, respond kindly, with care, with compassion, with empathy. Is that always the right response? You're talking about kids who are throwing chairs across the room and saying, we need to be kind. Is that is that what you're saying? Is that is that the right response? I think we always have to be kind and empathic, don't we? Obviously in the moment, it needs to stop. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying there doesn't need to be consequences or boundaries, obviously children need structure and boundaries, but maybe after the incident, how we react, that reacting within relationship, time in rather than time out, going through that, giving them, for an example, I, there was a pupil who was throwing chairs on a daily basis, the class were getting evacuated, um, and he was obviously taking up an awful lot of adult time. He was getting a lot of adult um, SLT time and it would take him about an hour to, to calm down outside on um, scooters, bikes, things like that. Mm. So we were looking at the, the need of the child and, and obviously he, he got an awful lot. He got a lot of task avoidance and he got an awful lot of adult time. And we were just talking about, well, give him what he needs but without him having to escalate the behaviors. Mm. Um, so in the mornings, we gave him some adult time with his favourite SLT member, playing games, building relationship, doing fun things, going out on the scooters with a timer. Then he went into class and the behaviours reduced because he wasn't having to escalate his behaviours to get his needs met. Do you, is, I don't know if that's kind of ask, answering your question or not, but um, it, it's kind of how, how can we get those needs met um, proactively without him having to escalate or without them having to escalate to to get them does that make any sense it does make sense, yeah. sense. Yeah. Sort of preventing the behavior rather than simply managing it I suppose um, and understanding yeah what what's the the cause and consequence here what's in it for the child behavior yeah. anyway, um, and therefore how can we meet that need without the behavior um, kind of being a necessary part of that cycle I think that's what I'm understanding <laughs> yeah that's what yeah if trying to see see what they're communicating by the hope by the behavior and putting that in in a more appropriate way um, that tends to work but obviously in the heat of the moment they need to be you know boundaries so you know I can see you're angry but chairs are not for throwing <laughs> <laughs> yes and when does the need of the individual child um kind of stop I, I guess I have a question here um, around, uh, you know, member of staff who might have 30 children who they have a duty of care towards and you're working with one of them. Um, when do their needs trump the needs of the other 29? And at what point do we have to say, well, we maybe need to do what's not optimal for the one in order to keep the others uh, safe or calm or engaged or, or, or what have you? What, what, how do we make those kinds of decisions? Um, well, we always have to keep the others safe, don't we, and engaged. Um, and I think by looking at those behaviours and putting in a plan proactively, we were kind of, the other children were at the heart of that as well, because um, he was taken out in the morning, he was having his needs met with the child. So the, the class were all settled. He was out of the picture, having all his needs met with the relationship and the um I guess it was a sensory need, the scooting and being, you know, getting energy out. And then he was more able to come back in class, more settled rather than escalating. So obviously the, the needs of the, the masses must be, must be taken into account and all, you know, all those children need to be safe, don't they? So definitely. And how much of this is the uh, responsibility of the adults around the child? So I'm a big Paul Dix fan and when the adults yeah. change, everything changes Absolutely. and that kind of thing. Um, but then how much of this is also about a child's understanding of self and their responsibility for themselves and, you know, whether that's about self-regulation or asking for help or whatever else it might be. And then also how much of it is about the understanding and support of their peers as well because presumably like in this example if the other children were able to I don't know recognize early warning signs or understand a bit about what was going on for this particular child that might have a big impact for everybody involved. Yeah and a lot of what we do is helping the child um, to, to, to begin to spot so starting with co-regulation 
but but helping the pupil begin to spot those early warning signs. Oh, I can see your fists have clenched and your head's gone down. I wonder if you need to go for a walk, or I wonder if if we can go and do some drumming in the hall, or things like that. So yeah, begin getting them to begin to spot those those early warning signs. And yeah, that's interesting what you said about getting other children to spot them too. And um, yeah, I think the more we can do about emotional regulation, the better, because we don't always understand. And I think I'm still learning even now what, you know, take when I've been doing this work, think, oh yeah, I've just taken a deep breath. And I didn't, I don't know if I really knew I was doing it. So the more we can kind of voice and model what we're doing to regulate and help children understand what they're doing, given those skills. Yeah, I, I, I can see your foot's tapping. I wonder if you're getting a little bit frustrated. Let's go and do this and come back to it or let's break this task down into smaller steps for you. Um, and, and spot spot those signs and help it can be a whole class discussion can't it and it um at our school we do like the zones of regulation um but it, and it's a whole class discussion of what you do at the different zones and how you can use those strategies to to regulate yourself um or alert yourself if necessary to to get back into that zone where you're able and willing to learn Absolutely. And do you find that with the, the, the children who, you know, from whom we, we are seeing sort of more, uh, I don't want to say challenging behaviour, just stress <laughs> behavior, um, or stress responses or whatever is our appropriate way where we're, we're you know, it's more difficult to, to work with them um, and they are finding things uh, more difficult. Are there kind of one of the things I'm hearing quite a bit at the moment is about children who've got perhaps um, undiagnosed needs in terms of special or additional need um, or where there might be some underlying trauma, for example, that's gone um, either unknown about or unsupported. Is that so firstly, does that speak to your experience? Are you seeing that too? And secondly, how important is it for us to actually do that kind of job, therefore, of identifies, identifying, diagnosing, labelling um, or do we just need to, to treat each child individually? Um, we, we definitely need to treat, treat each child individually. Um, yeah, it's not, I don't go in and label or diagnose. Um, obviously there's, for getting needs met that people have found that useful, but for, I think um, we need to kind of teach all children those skills and yeah, look at where the child's coming from, look at, because they might have some, you know, something that's going on that we don't, that we don't know about, and we'll never find out about something that's triggering them, that they might not even know what it is that's triggering something. So I think, yeah, definitely treat all children individually, give them those skills they need to regulate, to calm, and, and do this all through, it's through good relationships, good modelling. Absolutely. You're writing a book at the moment. I am. Tell me about yes. your book. So Beh Behaviour Barriers and Beyond, which I already love um, because it is alliterative and anyone who's ever <laughs> been to any of my training will know that I do this even without meaning too often. So <laughs> love the title. Tell me about the book. Um, so the book is, um, it came about because um, I basically thought I'm telling people this all the time, let's write it all down. So it's it's basically what I do in my job. So there's a general chapter about um behavior and reframing the behavior um talking about general kind of behavior management strategies and positive behavior management that um teachers will need to implement so um yeah strategies and then at the end of each chapter there's a strategy checklist as a quick reminder that the aim was is to get um a bit for everything to all be in one place that people that teachers and um, education staff can pick up really practically and run with kind of ideas that I've found to, to be working in mainstream schools and specialist settings but it supporting those children very very quickly it doesn't take an awful lot of time to implement and things like that so behavior and then the the following chapters are um, chapters that I'm having I deal with quite a lot so when you talked about labelling, there is a chapter on autism, there's a chapter on um, PDA, ADHD, fetal alcohol, spectrum disorder, um, sensory processing. So it, the aim is for it all to be in one place for teachers to pick up very quickly and then and just signposting them on once they've read a particular chapter if they want to go 
further um, research. So I've kind of signposted them on as well. So, yeah. How are you feeling? Are you feeling is it going well? Are you enjoying it? Oh, I'm absolutely loving writing it. Yeah, it's 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 brilliant. I love I love it. Um, I keep going through moments of absolute <gasps> panic and what have I done and ah, uh, why am I doing this? But um, yeah, yes. And you have very kindly agreed to write the foreword for me. So um, I'm, I'm I, I, it's one of my greatest pleasures in life when people ask me to write forewords for their books. Um, it, it's a thing that yeah, people do ask me. Um, more now than they used to and I feel like it's it's such a privilege because this is your baby that you poured everything into yeah. and I get the joy of being uh, a one of the first people to read it which is always quite exciting. <laughs> I hope you like it. <laughs> um, I'm sure I will um, and b um, I get to kind of help it land if that makes sense I think that I don't know I, I I don't know how much people always read forwards um and I find they're sometimes a bit boring but when I write them I try <laughs> to do them from the heart and to think about what is the ding that this book could have in the universe um and that's kind of my yeah my kind of starting point so yeah so thank you for for asking me to do that oh, I was so excited I did a little dance and you said yes <laughs> well I'm, I'm I'm excited too um mm -hmm. You said um, when we were like in the the, the, the pre podcast uh, sort of chat, uh, you, you sent me some info. You said that the writing the book had caused quite a lot of self reflection and looking back at your own um, kind of travels through life and, and stuff. I wonder if that's something that you're happy to, to kind of touch on and talk about. I think your own journey, if it's one that you're you're happy to talk about a little bit, is is interesting and um, yeah, I, I think probably informs quite a lot of what you you do. Yeah, it has made me very self-reflective writing this. And, and I think as I've learned different things, I've, I've kind of reflected on, um, on myself. I guess the biggest thing is that I was situational, shall we call it, mute when I was um, at university and before. So I spent my university years absolutely terrified of talking to um, anyone <laughs> but definitely in a in a seminar or in a lecture I don't think I spoke at all and I think once I got made to speak by a lecturer who um asked me a question <laughs> how dare he um, <laughs> but I I remember that absolute terror and my heart was pounding and my face went red and I was and I could almost feel, and I didn't know it at the time, but I could almost feel that um, my brain kind of shutting down and I could not think what to say and I was panicking. Then about an hour later, I thought, oh, I should have said that. But um, yeah, I, I remember just being absolutely paralyzed and unable to speak. So it kind of amazes me now that I go into, it still terrifies me and I'm, pretty terrified even just chatting to you here so it, it, it does I do still have those feelings but that, that I go and um, give conferences to loads of people and I give training to groups of groups of adults and that I think that's the biggest thing for me is is overcoming that kind of absolute anxiety and terror of of talking and it, it's taken an awful lot of time to be able to do it. I, I remember my first um, job when I was, I was moved to a um, nursery coordinator and I was asked to speak to a group of parents and the horror when my head teacher asked me to speak to a group of parents. I know, and it was awful. I stood there hiding behind a piece of paper that was shaking and yeah, it, it, it was terrifying. And that I think that anxiety has helped me to kind of break things down for pupils to think about what would help and how we can kind of help pupils to get through that because um and and relating it to it doesn't have to be about anxiety but breaking tasks down breaking things down into really simple steps because what helped me was then tackling things very very gently taking a step-by-step -step approach so I would I knew if I knew I had to present I would talk to myself talk to the mirror I would over prepare um, make sure that I knew everything there was about the subject and more um, and then I would talk to the mirror and then I'd talk to my husband and then I'd talk to a small group 
and then I talked to a bigger group and then I um, then I would be able to do it in the setting that it had to be in but it, it was definitely breaking it down um, yeah and the other thing that worked for me was kind of coming out of my comfort zone somewhere else so not talking but I was terrified of putting my face in the water and I learned to scuba dive so, to, to, so, so taking it out of the, out of my comfort zone elsewhere I think gave me the confidence then to be out of my comfort zone in this terrifying Talk, talk, talk. Sorry, you have to talk about that. So you, you had the fear of putting your face in the water, so you decided to learn to scuba dive. Yeah. It was a very conscious was, decision, a kind of personal challenge. I was terrified of it. My face, uh, was it a conscious decision? No, it was probably nagging from my husband who was desperate to scuba dive. Um, so we we learned to we learned to dive in Spain and then on honeymoon we did like two, but then we moved to Malaysia for five years and each time I got a bit more confident and then we did the rescue diver. And so, yeah, it was, it, it, it wasn't, no, it probably wasn't a conscious decision going, Oh, I need to get rid of my fears. Let's do that. It was, Oh, I, I succeeded in that. I, maybe I can succeed elsewhere. Okay. So it's almost like you could learn those skills in one setting and apply them uh, to another. And that, I think that maybe there's something very practical there for um, yeah, staff or parents who are working with a child who's, who's very, anxious about school say is actually picking maybe another bit of their life that feels a little bit less low stakes and, and tackling perhaps a, a, a fear there um might be a, a, a way in from what you're saying you know that, might that. Be. yeah I, I thought well if I can do this I can I can do anything if I can scuba dive and not drown then I, surely I can talk in front of a group of people do you find that um having had that history is that something that you um talk to students about are they aware of this in you or do you just does it just inform your practice quietly I think it just quietly informs my practice I talk to staff about it when I've I've talked to staff in staff training um about it and it um yeah when I bring it up it definitely spikes my anxiety levels as I'm talking about um about it um but yeah I've def I have linked it to um like the five point scale and things like that I've link linked it to stress levels within my training and talked about it then but I haven't talked about it with students I've talked about the diving with students and and overcoming fear but yeah no not not because I wouldn't but just because it hasn't arisen I think I, I'm, I'm hugely interested by uh, mutism I've done a couple of podcasts on it already and um, explored it a bit with uh, people and I found it very interesting learning more about it and how it's been recategorized as an anxiety disorder. And actually it's really informed a lot of my work and understanding of self. So um, I have, uh, and I've mentioned it in other podcasts where it's only really through learning about mutism that I've suddenly had like penny drop moments of like, oh yeah, all those weeks when I was forced to do group therapy when I was an inpatient and I didn't speak, that, yeah, that's an anxiety response. And like, it, it feels quite obvious now looking back, but at the time, I don't think I even knew it was happening. I just was in complete start or freeze. Hmm. I can't do this, like, mode. I don't think I knew what it was. I, I think I thought I was shy. I, hmm. It's only looking back that I thought, oh yeah, that was my brain shutting down. I was absolutely in flight. And I, I think the other interesting thing there is you saying, and I don't want to make you feel more anxious than we need to, so we can move <laughs> on from it, but that thing of that when you start talking about it, that it, it provokes those feelings. And I've, I've got myself into this real muddle when I'm public speaking that I talk, I teach a lot about communication um, and I, <laughs> it's going to happen now, I have this really awful cycle that started happening a couple of years ago and it perpetuates um, that <laughs> when I start talking about communication, I lose the ability to communicate completely. And I'll find I'm on a stage and suddenly I have nothing. Um, and those fears that, you know, I don't have any fear of public speaking, that doesn't worry me at all. But those fears that many people have about public speaking about, you know, there's 200 people in the room and you go completely back, it actually happens to me pretty much any time I start talking about communication these days. Mm. Which, um, inconvenient to say the least yeah <laughs> yeah I have a, a great strategy for it now though and that's thing we learn all the time don't we and I think when mm. we can practice the things uh, that we, we we preach I basically now have like a little toolbox of um 
different strategies that I find helpful to teach people, um, sort of regulation type strategies or breathing strategies. Um, and I find that if ever I'm beginning to feel uh, panic rising or I've lost my words, I just have scripts that I go to and I just teach people these things and it calms me down and it calms them down and then we move on. But yeah, I guess my I, I, I just find it interesting that you're saying that talking to people about it makes you, yeah, about that anxiety makes you anxious. <laughs> yeah. It, it it sparks all those all those feelings that I had before and and I do I kind of massage my palms a lot and I didn't realize that I was like oh that's a sensory thing but it's only really other <laughs> I get that rushing feeling of anxiety and that that's what that is but it's only since kind of reflecting and doing this that I've realized so we need to teach the children those steps they teach them early don't we because I didn't know and I used to feel sick before school every day and I didn't know why and you know that, that was anxiety what do you think would have helped? So it sounds like for you, maybe things got steadily sort of more challenging to it got to the point where at university you were finding it very difficult to, to engage. What do you think, you know, if you were able to plant yourself now to support the staff that, that perhaps helped you at school or university, what would you have told them? What could have made a difference? To them? I think if, if they could have recognised it for what it was, not just being um, shy or being defiant because I wasn't being defiant I was desperate to speak and all my assignments you know all my written assignments were were fine you know I, I I engaged and I engaged in everything that I was asked to do unless it involved speaking so I think if someone had recognized it or I had recognized it which I didn't and that, that there was something that could be do I thought it was just me I didn't realize there was something that could be done to overcome that I thought oh this is me and this is how I'm going to be for the rest of my life um I think maybe if someone had come and said, all right, okay, so what can we do to make it better and do those little steps? So, okay, so tomorrow we're, I'm going to ask you this question. We can prepare. What sort of things could you answer? Because I would think I was terrified of getting it wrong and making a fool of myself. So that kind of escalated. So if, if someone had been beside me and said, right, okay, well, you know, this is the right, you know, you know, this is an answer you could give, you know, this is this and broken it down tomorrow, I'm going to ask you and then you can, and I was prepared for it, then maybe I could have spoken if I'd rather than it out the blue and just shocking me. I think that, yeah, small steps to prepare for it, chunking it down. Maybe I could have just spoken to the lecturer first then to a peer, then to a smaller group, then to the whole group. Maybe if it had been broken down in that way, I might have. And how I might have just decided to panic, who knows? <laughs> well, maybe, but I think what you're saying is that that's exactly the approach we would hope to take, isn't it? Is that, you know, building, I always talk about I can cycles. So building up cycles of things that we can do, no matter how tiny those steps are. Yeah. And yeah, and building on those successes. Do, do, what what did happen in the end? How did you? So you said I know you said that obviously the the, the scuba diving, the realization that you can, you can do that, you can do other things. But had, was there a kind of moment when things changed, or was this a gradual thing? Um, I think it was a gradual thing. The the speaking in front of people. Do you mean? I think that it was a gradual thing because um, it just kind of I had to do it for interviews. You had to present, and I, I would have not got any jobs so I, ha I had to I had to do it it came out of a need but the way I did do it was very very slowly talking you know over preparing and going presenting to a small group for, or one person first then a small group first then um and yeah. is there a day that girls like you oh, work yeah. because you know the, the kinds of kids that maybe people have come to listen or what's the podcast today about are more the kinds that we've referred to earlier who are you know kind of throwing chairs or where they're essentially they're, they're more difficult for us to manage in a classroom situation for whatever reason but children who are kind of maybe quietly disengaged for whatever reason but that are producing the work um, and not causing any trouble I fear that sometimes they just pass by under the radar and that they don't really get much connection with, with people and I'm, I'm really deeply worried about those children right now and I think there's going to be more of them following the pandemic where they've had very quiet lives for a long time and just wonder what your kind of thoughts are on that whether you, yeah whether your thoughts match mine and it's fine if they don't and, and what do we do about it if they do? Absolutely I think there's a real danger of those very very quiet pupils 
being missed. And I definitely was missed because the work was produced. I would never seek help. Um, so, yeah, and I think the more we can be aware that even though they're not doing these big behaviours, that those pupils need, need support, those children need support. And for adults to engage with them, I was talking to someone the other day, actually, and she, she was talking about reading with some really, really quiet um, children. And we were talking about little steps that she could do to, to put in, to just, just kind of give them that, that voice and, and, and building up that relationship. They have got a, they have got a means of expressing those feelings and, and, but yeah, they're definitely in a danger of being missed, aren't they? Because who are you going to go to? You're going to go to the one who's throwing the chairs or are you going to go to the one who's sitting in the corner doing their work? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, I quite often find myself thinking back to um, when I did my first aid training and I remember the you know learning as a six-year-old for the first time about first aid. I used to go to Badgers with St John's and, and, and for some reason it just really stuck in my mind that you know if you found yourself at a scene of a big accident that there would be people who were screaming out for your help but you had to ignore them because actually they were okay and it was the ones that were quiet that you had to go to and I kind of feel like maybe it's the same in the classroom but maybe I'm over extrapolating. <laughs> no, that's a good analogy we do yeah how do we miss how do we go to those ones who who might get missed and we need to form relationships with them don't we and I think building self-esteem as well telling people what they're doing well especially those quiet ones tell them what they're doing really really well um because we that's helped me as well I, I work in a really supportive setting and um my outreach lead before me was just amazing at telling me what I was doing well and, and building on that and I think if we can do that for our pupils build on what they they already do but just build that self-esteem and help help them know what they're doing well we need to be told I think and how do we do that if it's not obvious I mean some some children there might not be anything that when we kind of look in there might not be any obviously good things we might hear all the bad things particularly for someone like you who's being brought in because you know this child is causing us a problem we need help yeah um how do we find the the good and we, oh, and I always start with, um, tell me what he's good at, tell me what she's, tell me what her strengths are, tell me what she likes, and you have, you have to get there, <laughs> you have to, there is, there's always something good, and I think it gets missed in this negative spiral sometimes, um, and for those, those quiet children, let's, let's not maybe go, oh, you're sitting really nicely and quietly, maybe that's not what they need praising for, <laughs> they need praising for, for other things that they're, they're doing well but yeah definitely fine even if it's the smallest thing oh you've picked up your pencil I can see you're ready to write now that catch them those little steps to success we've got to catch them being good and and do they say 10 neg 10 positive um interactions for every negative so we have to find those positives and turn it around and I think just turning the language around sometimes just gets out of that negative spiral and gets us more positive even if it's just the way we view a, a child. I did say to a, a, a teacher once, and it, it seemed to have got into this negative spiral. And I was like, right, before the lesson, I want you to think of 10 things that you really, really like about this pupil. Things that, that she's good at, things that she um, that you like about her, things that she said that made you laugh. Just And, and before you go into the lesson, I want you to think of ten, those 10 positive things. And I want you to praise her for every single one of them during the lesson. She was like, oh, okay. But it, it just turned the, the, that negative spiral around and turned it more positive. That's a really nice, really nice. Uh, really nice exercise, actually, both in terms of making a stop and focus on, on a child who we might not have the, the kindest thoughts towards always, um, but also in terms of literally building that, that relationship and that self-esteem. Might have felt a little bit odd to the child, do you think, in that first instance, if they weren't used to receiving that praise? Um, yes, maybe. And, and praise is always sometimes difficult, isn't it, to take if you're not used to it. Um, so... Yeah, I think it was successful, but yeah, I get where you're coming from. And, and sometimes we say put, put the, the praise a little bit less direct, so just to post it on the desk and walk away sort of thing, but um, if they do have trouble with praise. But yeah, I was trying to take, change the teacher's view of the pupil. Um, oh, I love it. It feels like a radical uh, yeah, way of doing it. But actually, particularly if there's become that negative uh, relationship 
uh, going on. And um, I think that's really important. And, you know, I have occasionally found myself um, because I'm not very good at not just saying what's in my head quite bluntly, um, but occasionally talking to a member of staff and going, I don't think you like this child very much. And actually being able to just tackle that and go, we need to think about what, what do you like about them? Because it's obviously quite a toxic relationship. And if you don't like them, it's going to be really, really hard to, to be the adult they need to enable them to thrive, isn't it? So we need to and they'll know, them. won't they? They'll pick up on, this teacher doesn't like me. Yeah. And, and we do need to... Um, sometimes bring out our Oscar winning performances of like, but sometimes just turning our own perspective. Actually, I've got this wrong. I just, it's easy, isn't it? To get into a negative spiral and just think all negative things about someone, especially on a Friday afternoon when you've had it and uh, you think that those behaviors are out to get you, but you need to think underneath them and what's going on for that pupil. And I think, again, kind of yeah, coming full circle back to that idea of that what you're seeing is um, sort of dis distress um, or stress behaviour, a child who is, is experiencing, for whatever reason, some kind of trauma response in this moment um, can help us just to think about what is the response that they need from me as an adult right now, even if it doesn't feel like they're the most natural uh, place to go. Wow, we've covered a lot, Rachel, in a short time. <laughs> What um what kind of thought would you like to sort of wrap up and, and close with? What thought would you like to leave people with as we come to an end? Um so I think uh I think let's should we go back to what we started with? Be curious, wonder why the behaviors are happening, or wonder why the children aren't motivated to go back to that question that we started with. Um I think if we if we kind of be curious, we wonder why we build relationship then we can offer the supports that are needed. But I think, I think we need to, to kind of understand the people and what's behind those, those behaviours a bit more. And then we can put in all the strategies to help 